What I'm going to try to do is give you in one hour, which is almost impossible, a picture of what is wrong in the brain of a person after they develop the disease of addiction. So we have here what is supposed to be a normal brain. Don't worry, I'll explain it all. And then I'm going to paint little by little over there the picture of what are the changes that happen when a person develops addiction. Then we can maybe make some kind of conclusions or interpretations or change dramatically the way you see addiction. I have to get started by telling you we thought this is the normal brain and this is the brain of an addict. It's normal. There's nothing wrong that we can identify. So it's all psychological, weakness, selfishness, narcissistic, stupidity. That's the way we conceptualize the disease initially, but we can no longer say so because now we have neuroimaging who can tell us what is going wrong in the brain. Not only that, we're learning tremendously about the essence of being human through this disease, as well as another disease that you, some of you may be familiar with, schizophrenia, which are my main interests. I am a psychiatrist, a psychopharmacologist, and an addictionologist. And probably my interest has been to put together all my training into addiction, to maybe paint a more uh, truthful view of the disease. And honestly, the more I get into this, the more disturbed I feel by the way we're treating people with addiction. So everything started with addiction with a normal brain. But in order to understand a normal brain, we have to clarify some issues. Issues that we discover accidentally, precisely through addiction. First of all, you see that tiny little thing right here? Okay, this is half of my brain, I'm looking in that direction. So imagine that I remove this half and you're looking at that area. My eye is around here, my mouth, my face, the back of my head, and this is looking inside my brain. We noticed that the reason we thought addiction was a selfish narcissistic desire to get high, voluntarily done, is because obvious, obviously that's what we see. They get high, they like to get high, they don't care about nothing else, and all they want to do is to be high. You tell them stop, but they don't stop. We thought they want to continue getting high. And we know why, and that is known from the beginning. That is because of that tiny area that you see right here, which is no bigger than this side. It's a tiny area. It's in both hemispheres, so I have two of them. And it's called the nucleus accumbens. Why do we have that in the brain that makes us feel so good? Why we have it? Worms has it. Butterflies has it. All animals has nucleus accumbens. So the first question is, let's destroy that thing in animals and see what happens. The animal will stand in the corner. They will not eat, groom, sleep, eat, or do absolutely nothing. They die. So we realize that that tiny area seems to be connected to another area of the brain that motivate and make us feel good when we do things that we should do. So the reason I drink water is not because I want to drink water. It's because my brain senses that I'm low in water and it will tell my internal brain, make him crave water. And I will all of a sudden say, I'm thirsty. So I go and drink water. When I drink water, I release dopamine in that area of the brain and I feel pleasure. So I'm reinforcing a behavior that can keep me hydrated or alive or healthy. Like that, we have identified multiple behavior that we do naturally. Sometimes we can 
interfere with it, well, I breathe. I'm not telling myself, breathe, don't breathe, breathe, don't breathe. Something internal is doing it for me. I could stop my breathing, but it will not be for long. As soon as this part of the brain, the internal brain, realizes that I'm holding my brain, my breath, it will force me to breathe. So I have some control, but no total control over it. So whenever you do something positive, something right, this area of the brain, ventral tegmental area, they have weird names and there's nothing I can do about that. The ventral to mental area is connected with the whole brain. And when you do something right, it releases dopamine, a neurotransmitter that is produced when we do good things as a reward. So when I drink water, something in my brain senses it, and this thing sends a signal to the nucleus accumbens. And it pours dopamine into it. And I feel pleasure, satiation, satisfaction. So we have a tiny area connected with the whole brain, which by releasing dopamine makes me feel pleasure. So the brain has this sacred system to motivate me to do things and when I do them, I get rewarded. So the nucleus accumbens is the reward system. I give my kids $20 because he behave. He gets the $20 and feel good. Now he's going to try to do whatever he was doing that I gave him the $20. That way I reinforce reward and his brain will teach him to be motivated to do it. If I reprimand my kid about something, he feels bad. So this area shut down dopamine and the nucleus accumbens feel bad. So everything we do, good or bad, is done by this tiny area receiving or not receiving dopamine from the very mental area. So look how strategically correct, uh, connected. It's a tiny area in an isolated location, but it is connected, wired, through a circuitry to the whole brain. So the reward system is what the drugs stimulate. So you do drugs, it doesn't matter which one. All drug of abuse release dopamine in the brain, <coughs> of course. Because dopamine is the language needed to stimulate the reward system. I joke around to make people understand. If the chemical in pineapple is what makes this thing feel good, pineapples will be the worst drug of abuse on earth. It will be banned, destroyed, and nobody can walk around with pineapples. Because dopamine happens to be the neurotransmitter, the brain decided to use anything that increases dopamine in the brain is going to stimulate the nucleus accumbens. By the way, he releases dopamine, dopamine goes here, and this tiny thing is connected with the whole brain. So you feel a unique sensation that seems to be pleasurable, that we call a high or satisfaction. You can call happiness sometimes. Now everything causes that. I can grow up in a culture that something will bring down my dopamine while somebody else can grow up in a culture and that same thing can make them feel good. Let me give you a, a, a little nasty example. In Arab country, when you finish eating, you have to burp. That means the, good was, the food was good. But in our society, you burp while you're eating, and they're going to say to you, what's wrong with you? <laughs> so look how one behavior can be taught to be good or bad, depending on culture. So we don't have the same 
behavior associated with a good response. We learn it depending on the culture, the city, the country, the continent, the hemisphere, etc., etc. So then we have this hippocampus. And what is here? This is the memory center where you assimilate everything that you learn in your culture that is good and is not good. So you, we behave socially because we learn from early on a set of behaviors that we should or should not do. Now you see inside those little lines that they're going down, they are organized in a very specific way. The more dopamine you release, the more important it's going to be as a memory. The lower the dopamine, the less important it will be. So while addiction was thought to be just a stimulation in the nucleus accumbens to make you feel high, we realized that addiction has taken over something much more important. And it has to do with the memories. So in addiction, besides reward, we have memories of what is called the motivational system. So, if the most pleasurable thing in the memory is here, and we happen to know what it is in human because we measure it, is the behavior that gives you the highest level of dopamine. It's called orgasm. You're going to get 200 units of dopamine when you do that. Why the brain is doing that? Because when you have one, you reproduce. And that is the most important function in humans. We eat, we drink, we take care of ourselves, we behave so we can reproduce. So the highest prevalent in brain is coming from an orgasm. 200 units. So you're going to get 200 units when you have an orgasm. What you don't realize is that you're not doing it to have the fun. You're doing it so you can reproduce. So they come after, meaning you reproduce, we reward you, we give you pleasure. So if this is the highest amount of dopamine we can get from a behavior, you get 150 when you graduate, you get uh, 175 when people reward you, you get 225 when you smoke a cigarette. But you don't get it in 15 seconds, you get it in much more time. But now you're doing something that is going to give you 4, 6, 8 times that amount of pleasure, any substance of abuse. I'm not talking about be addictive behavior, but they're exactly the same. I'm not talking about food addiction, gambling, uh, kleptomania hoarding, that kind of behaviors, only substances, chemicals. So when your brain experiences pleasure from a drug, it is getting a huge amount of dopamine being released into the nucleus accumbens. It goes like this. The drugs go to the ventral temental area. It releases an unbelievable amount of dopamine, which makes the nucleus accumbens feel a tremendous amount of pleasure. This amount of pleasure measure up to a thousand units of dopamine. It is almost immediately put into the memory. But it's not going to be put down here. It's going to be put on this side. So now you're going to have a memory inside your brain which is going to be huge for the use of drugs. And that will take priority over any of the previous memorized behaviors that you have in your brain. So drugs, by impacting over the brain, will modify the circuitry related to reward, memory, and motivation. And you're going to substitute any 
behavior that is, was pleasurable for the use of substances.